Hello, everyone. Um, I understand we have guests from all over the world, uh, people uh, getting out of bed in uh, the United States. Thank you for doing that. You're most welcome, people in Norway, uh, across these islands uh, and from all sorts of different communities. So you're all very welcome indeed. This is uh, 100 years of Northern Ireland and the partition of Ireland. How has it gone? Um, you know, some people might think there's a very, a very swift answer to that, but we're going to spe spend the next two hours discussing with some very fine minds. Indeed, we're in great company today. But first, let's hear from the Lord Mayor of Belfast, Frank McCoubrey. Good afternoon everyone and welcome to our decade of centenaries event. This event is part of our weather programme for this year, which is a very significant year in our history as we mark the 100th anniversary of the formation of Northern Ireland. We have been running our decades of centenaries programmes since 2011 and each year we reflect on significant events in the city's past through programmes and events in order to build a shared understanding of our history in a way that can build good relations and foster reconciliation. Unfortunately, the impact of the pandemic meant that we are not able to run our programmes as planned. However, with the support of each of our speakers and our technical partners, we have been able to ensure that our events can still happen. Further still, anyone with an internet connection anywhere in the world can join in the events now. Today's event is a discussion on the last 100 years of Northern Ireland, and I would like to thank our chairperson, Tara Mills, and all of our speakers for their participation. I would also like to thank ND Events for their professional hosting of the event. And finally, I would like to thank the hundreds of people who are logging on to join us for this important conversation. As we continue our 2021 programme, we are exploring COVID safe ways of marking this significant year, and we will strive to continue to deliver events in a way that builds that shared understanding of our collective history in order to move forward together in the spirit of reconciliation. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Lord Mayor. And uh, I just would like to point out that this event is part of Belfast City Council's Decade of Centenaries, as Frank McCubrey said there. And it's part funded by the Executive Office through their District Council's Good Relations Programme. So as I said earlier, we're in very fine company today. Um, at the moment, I just do this early plug for our Year 21 podcast on BBC Northern Ireland. It's available on BBC Sounds or wherever you get your podcast. But the reason I'm mentioning that is also because I think with the exception of our first speaker, we're going to, to hear from all of the speakers and we've already spoken to a couple of them and uh, they've given us some brilliant contributions to that podcast which is telling the story week by week and um, so today we have uh, Lord Paul Bew, uh, we have Professor Mary Daly, uh, Professor Thomas Hennessy, Dr Marie Coleman and very unfortunately Dr Sean Byers um, hasn't been able to attend today and just to give you a sense and you'll see the, the, on the screen now that uh, Lord Bew is of course the chair of the Northern Ireland Office Centenary Historical Advisory Panel Professor Mary Daly is from University College Dublin and the Royal Irish Academy. Uh, Professor Thomas Hennessy, Professor of Modern British and Irish History at Canterbury Christchurch University and Dr Marie Coleman, School of History, Anthropology, Philosophy and Politics at Queen's University, Belfast. As I say, we're in fine company. We've got lots to talk about. A hundred years in some ways may not seem like a long time when you start sort of digging into the events of 1921. But uh, let's kick off with Lord Bew. And um, Lord Bew, I'd like to sort of start with you and ask, you know, how do you think we should mark the centenary? And, and how do you think the events of 1921 have shaped our lives today? Well, in the first place, I do think that the Lord Mayor's words a few minutes ago are entirely appropriate. We should be trying to build a shared understanding. And the Committee of Historians advising me uh, um, uh, represent people from diverse backgrounds, different historical approaches, but they're all united by a passionate commitment to historical truth. 
and that's I think the the underlying theme of, of, of our committee and the various events that we're trying to put on or, or, or be involved in. Uh, we the only way you can attempt to bring, build a shared understanding of what are very controversial matters is by trying to, by displaying a very scrupulous attitude to, in the way that you carry on your historical research. So that that's the first thing I'd say. Second thing, I was looking at at, 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 the, at, the, at the Lord Mayor. I, I realise he's in the room where the King actually made the speech, and just behind him is, is the place where the King actually made the speech, which uh, launched that Parliament. And that alone tells you, or formally launched it, had been running uh, uh, a few days before. But that was the formal opening of the Northern Ireland Parliament. There's an awful lot going on there. Uh, Nationalists don't attend. Um, one of the things that everybody has to accept is that both states in Ireland are founded in violence and that the violence in Belfast bore down more heavily on the Catholic community than on the Protestant community, although there was a lot of violence on both sides, but Catholics suffered more. Shipyard expulsions are, for example, of the previous summer, a major event of importance, which one of our uh, committee members, Professor Henry Patterson, has actually in the past written the most about detailing what happened. Uh, 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 and it, it, we have to accept these unhappy memories as well as the incredible enthusiasm of the crowds for the King that day, delight to see an Northern Ireland Parliament up and running. But these are the complexities of Irish history. The King is there probably because Jan Scott, the Prime Minister of South Africa, had said, go and make a conciliatory speech. And the key words in, in, in the King's speech are to forgive and forget. Irishmen of all sides to forgive and forget at a time of violence. Doesn't call for the IRA to give up its violence, just says everybody should forgive and forget and try to move on. He's trying to push the peace process along. What you have to understand is that on one level, James Craig is there as the Prime Minister of Northern Ireland to celebrate a victory. The Northern Ireland Parliament is set up. The principle of consent has won, has won out. Um, there is not going to be the placing of the community in Belfast or under a Dublin Parliament. On the other hand, he has placed himself beside the peace faction, the British government, the doves who want to deal with Sinn Féin. He'd taken a great physical risk a month before to actually uh, go and meet Eamon de Valera. And once he's met with Eamon de Valera, you know there's going to be talks to the British government. If James Craig, the great Northern Orangeman, can meet with Eamon de Valera in order to bring this violence to an end, then you know it's only a matter of time before the London government is going to be meeting uh, with, with, with Eamon de Valera. So, you know, what's happening is a lot more complicated. Um, there are some historians, serious historians like Professor Keith Middlemass, who actually believe that Smuts was put up to saying to the king, go to Belfast and make a conciliatory speech by Eamon de Valera himself. So what's going on in the background or the immediate context is not just quite what you see on the screen, which is a triumph indisputably for, for unionism. There's a lot more complexity. People are actually striving for peace in their no doubt partial and unsatisfactory ways. So what I'm really trying to say is always the history of Northern Ireland. It's a bit more complex than it looks at first shot. Uh, at first sight of those crowds and the Union Jacks waving. And secondly, the other thing I'd say about it is, and this is part of the, just looking ahead for the next 100 years, part of the paradox of Northern Ireland and partition is that everybody, unionists and nationalists, British civil servant in London, all believed that Northern Ireland couldn't pay its own way. It was doomed. And nationalists believe that's why it won't last, because it won't be able to pay its own way. Uh, and when the world of pressure hits Belfast shipyards, it certainly can't. Actually, it turns out that what everybody on all sides agree is the great weakness of Northern Ireland is going to be dependent on London financially to maintain the living standards of the people of the Falls and on the Shankill and uh, to keep them in the first world. That turns out to be its great success. The union operates in a way that nobody quite anticipated, and certainly nobody is advertising it as that in 1921 which is it just becomes impossible if it's a United Kingdom to say, well, we want the United Kingdom, we want the people of Yorkshire to have certain social and economic standards, we don't care about the people of Northern Ireland. There's a logic to the union which nobody anticipated. And one of the things I think we would try and do as this committee is not just talk about the political and the harsh matters and the violence, all of which has to be faced up to, but also there is an economic and social life of Northern Ireland. People did have to eat just like they eat everywhere else. They did have to work. 
on the whole context of the union and what it delivered in material terms. On the whole, more successfully than was expected. On the whole, until the last generation or so, more successfully in terms of material life, in terms of not forcing people to leave the country. Population rises in Northern Ireland after first decades after the Easter Rising and Falls in the Irish Republic. Uh, on the whole, materially, the record of the union, you can't describe that as a failure. So those are the thoughts I'd, I'd like to open with at any rate, Tara. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting that you should say, should say that. And I think the economic and social life will definitely be a theme today. But, you know, were there things that unionists could have done differently? Um, you know, when you look at the complexities and you've laid out that out very well of what was happening on the island, what, you know, what nationalists in the south were thinking, what unionists in the north were thinking and how those sides wanted to, you know, have some sort of permanence. But were there things maybe later in the hundred years that unionists could have done differently? Because you talk about the, the success of Northern Ireland, but for so many nationalists, that is not how they see it. Oh, absolutely. There's a failure, of, there's a persistent failure of mode of address to the nationalist community. Now, all these things are a little bit more complicated than they appear at first. But there is a, Carson makes a speech when he resigns as leader of the Unionist Party in 1921, which he says, we should reach out to the best on the other side. I don't think you can reasonably say that. Uh, I've, uh, like a lot of people under lockdown, people look to their family histories. And I knew my great uncle was a Catholic priest. But actually what I didn't know was he was one of the longest serving Catholic chaplains in the British Army in the First World War. He um, it was a, with Allenby in Jerusalem. He was in France. He medal after medal. He was torpedoed at one point. He was wounded at another point. I asked myself this. There are a number of, and indeed there are friends of mine whose family members are Presbyterian clergymen, for example, who got military crosses and chaplains in the First World War. They came home. Suppose my, my, my uncle went, went, went back to carried on his work as priest in London. Suppose he had come to Northern Ireland Despite that military record, would he have felt that Carson's promise or the demand that the unions reach out to the best on the other side was being reached? And I've many years ago when I worked on the history of the Northern Irish state, one of the things that is most disturbing is the way in which, not that people are afraid of employing Catholics and Republicans, you've got to be very clear about this. Dublin Castle was subverted, the point made by the Nationalist MP Stephen Gwynn. Sinn Féin subverted Dublin Castle, people were betrayed, people were murdered by their work colleagues, right? You can't expect the unionists to forget that. that they, they, sometimes people talk about it as if somehow this context, which is obviously up in their minds, didn't exist in terms of extra discrimination. But for example, I have to say the thing that made me very uncomfortable when I worked on the Stormont Archives was the way in which, for example, Catholics with good with, with First World War records are not treated fairly, people who have fought for the United Kingdom and so on. There is a problem there, there is no doubt about it at all, and it's a problem in the nature of devolution itself. Craig, when he makes his first speech at the Northern Ireland Parliament, says this is going to be a new form of responsive government. Before we had this, government was way in London, too far away from the people. The trouble is, who are you responding to? And it's all too easy giving the structures of unionism that you're responding to the Orange Order, you're responding to the Ulster Unionist Labour Association or whatever. And they're first in the queue. Now, it doesn't mean that it always at every point they get their way. They, they always had, a, when Lord Londonderry was, was a, minister, a minister, but even throughout the whole time, the senior civil service, uh, top civil service, for example, dealing with education, tend to be Catholic. Because there's a pragmatic acceptance. The Catholic Church is out there, there are lots of Catholic schools. Let's deal with this as practically as we can. Let's not have any unnecessary problems. So there are within the system streaks of common sense, but there is a human failure to actually live up to what Carson asked for. I don't think Carson is that great a hero in all this uh, um, because, for example, he did not support the people. Says. That's why he makes these bitter speeches in 1922. It's Craig who took the risk. It's Craig who said, it doesn't matter whether it sticks in my throat, I'm going to have to meet the devil there, meet and talk with the devil there in May 1921. And it's Carson who says we should fight on and fight on to defeat the IRA as if that would have made any difference to long-term problems. Uh, uh, um, so I, but Carson did at least ask for that and it was not delivered on. They did not reach out to the best on the other side. Um, it, not to, uh, there are moments when they did, but as a general practice, they did not. 
And it's difficult, isn't it, as well? Because if you take something, you mentioned Henry Patterson's work on the on the shipyard expulsions. And I suppose if you if you look at that in uh, in isolation, um, then you look at what Craig did was, you know, come and speak to the, the shipyard workers and say, do I agree with what you did? Yes, I do. So it, it, there's that kind of sense, you know, if you take a sort of step back and look at that objectively, where was the leadership there? Was yeah, I I I I think I, I think Tara if you, if, if, that you were getting I lost the last bit, but you're 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 getting at the failure of leadership, and what Craig said is absolutely true. Uh, but interestingly, see, in 1912, when there was a lot of tension during the Home Rule crisis. At that point, the unionist leadership says, no, no, people must get back into their work, but not having trouble in the shipyard and so on. And the difference is in 1912, there's no, or they would say, the difference is there's no IRA out there killing people uh, all over the island and to a significant degree in Belfast as well. That's their excuse. But nonetheless, it, you've got to look at it from the point of view of the Catholic working class in Belfast. How are you going to look at these celebrations setting up this new storm of parliament? Is anything other than excluding you as anything other than it's deeply unfair. How are you going to look at the new state institutions uh, and the police force and the B specials as anything other than deeply unfair and oppressive? You can't expect, there's no other possible way of looking at it from that point of view. And I don't think there's, any, you know, there, 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 there can be no question about that. And there is that, there is that failure of leadership. Now, I can produce quotes from Craig at certain points, particularly when he was younger, where occasionally he seems to kind of, get a grip and suddenly say, we must reach out. Uh, and uh, there's a speech in 1926, he says, you're not a patriot if you just want Northern Ireland to succeed and the government in Dublin to fail. Fail. We, we want them both to develop alongside together and have good relations. So there, you know, it, 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 it's a parody, an unfair parody to say at every moment, everything they said was cast in terms of bitterness or unreasonableness. But there nonetheless is a responsibility. I would say, especially after the mid-20s, when the immediate security threat is gone, uh, when the immediate fear of that you're going to be assassinated is gone, to put it bluntly, which the unionist political leadership would have had quite reasonably. When that's gone, then the there's a failure there. And the civil war is broken outside. The Irish government is prepared, for example, in 1925, Northern Ireland in the, in the tripartite agreement is recognised by the Dublin government. And in fact, what happens later on the 1937 constitution is just an internal political statement. In international law, Northern Ireland has been recognised since the 1920s by, uh, 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 by the Dublin government. Um, and I would say there were moments there which, which should have been built on. And Craig makes half a stab on it, and Joe Devlin comes back into the parliament. But he really, to be honest, only makes half a stab at it. He makes a few positive speeches. There's no consistent policy which says, we've got to grip this moment. It's a human failure to have a third of our citizens feeling alienated from government the way they are, and to have a mode of address which frequently, not always, but frequently excludes them. And that's, it, there's, no, there's no escaping that criticism of the unionist leadership. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting to hear your thoughts on this. I ju just a final point before we, we move on. Um, you know, do we place too much emphasis on events from 1965 onwards as we look back at the 100 years? You know, is there something to be learned from that period in 1921? Um, that does dictate a lot of how, you know, nationalists and unionists feel about their identity and um, about their traditions. But do you think we, we we could look at that a bit more and learn more rather than the prism that we tend to look through, which is from sort of 65 onwards? Yeah, that's, that's a really very, very, very interesting question. Uh, there's an important speech this week by Jim O'Callaghan, the Fianna Fáil TD, who is critical of the T-shirt Micheál Martin because Micheál Martin is clearly indicating that the Irish government is not at its point in time interested in pushing the idea of a border poll and is clearly regards that as counterproductive. And to be honest, with the exhaustion in both parts of Ireland with COVID, just not not realistic. Now, uh, uh, Jim O'Callaghan has criticised that position from a more traditional, if you like, Republican Fianna Fáil point of view in a major speech in Cambridge. But he also says partition is, quote, he's not saying he's correct or he endorses it, but he accepts it's not irrational. 
given the balance and given the play, given, given the situation that exists, as many commentators decide there are actually two nations in Ireland, both have a right of self-determination, both have a right not to be coerced, and so on and so forth. Um, and you could make an argument for saying that the 1998 agreement gave retrospective validation just as the 1918 election gave retrospective validation to the Sinn Féin victory in Nationalist Ireland, to the 1916 rising. So 1998 agreement, which all the Irish people voted for, said that there is a democratic basis to partition. And actually, interesting, Jim O'Callaghan's really fundamentally with that, despite being a very strong, by modern Fianna Fáil standards, Republican. So that tells you something about how you should always keep the background in mind, because the problem for reform, and I speak as somebody who was involved in the civil rights movement, the problem is this, essentially, it's not like America, where it is the reform of these United States. It, it always is linked to the idea that it may also be about the absorption of one state into another certainly in the perception of those who oppose us in the civil rights movement. So you're quite right. You can't analyze these questions of what happened from the late, from the 1960s onwards and the many failures on all sides, particularly in the early phase by unionist government and unionist polity uh, uh, and so on. Uh, you can't analyze it without having that background in your mind that, you know, it, 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 the, the, the reality is it's not just a civil rights movement in the simple sense. Uh, and one of the things you so as you give away, and I say this with some slight degree of self-criticism of having involved in the civil rights movement. For example, we never talked about integrated education. It was always about specific things that Catholics lost out on, the unfair voting rights of local government, if not in parliamentary elections and so on. But you know, integrated education is central to American civil rights. It just tells you it's not the same story. They're freighted with different histories. And one of the freighted histories is the fact that nationalists until 1998 did not accept the legitimacy of Northern Ireland, despite, for example, the fact that the Irish state had done so in the mid twenties. And that is that that made the reform of Northern Ireland, the fact that you couldn't separate out reform and equality of treatment you couldn't separate that out from the prospect of creeping unification or the fear of creeping unification. Very frequently, dramatically exaggerated by unionists, by the way, and to this day, dramatically exaggerated by unionists, uh, given the broad economic realities which Northern Ireland finds itself in, if nothing else, and political realities. Uh, uh, um, but nonetheless, the, f the fact that you could separate out reform, the issue of reform, which is undoubtedly required from the prospect of the fear of creeping unification. So that's why you do have to, Tara, I agree with you completely said it in that longer historical context. Yeah, lovely. Thank you so much. We'll come back to you in the in the question and answer session. Um, I'd like to welcome now Professor Mary Daly. Um, it's really great to have you with us today, uh, Mary, to give a sort of sense of the Southern perspective. And I just wonder, we, you know, anybody living in Northern Ireland at the minute knows that there's not a settled feeling about this centenary year, but is it different in Dublin? Well, I think there's many dimensions to the centenary year and there's many complexities to it. And some people focus on some aspects and some people focus on other aspects. And I think a lot of the focus uh, in very, particularly, particularly outside Dublin, would be on events in the War of Independence. You know, in other words, what they're focusing on this year would be would be more what happened uh, down in Cork in Tipperary, various uh, incidents, ambushes, uh, deaths, uh, and and other such events, um, rather than necessarily the focus on the fact that it's the centenary of Northern Ireland. Now, it's been very different in border areas where. Uh, that is something that, that, that matters a lot. And I, I'm a member of the expert advisory group, uh, the, the, the Dublin equivalent to, Paul, to the group that Paul's involved in. And, you know, we're very conscious that this is the centenary of Northern Ireland. And we're very conscious of the fact that this is much more a live political issue today than a lot of the other aspects of the centenary that we have been commemorating. In other words, it's not history, it's, it is history, but it's also quite contemporary. Uh, and uh, we're also conscious of divided views on it. And one of the bits that we've been trying to emphasize is get the border communities to begin to look at 
how this inter how this worked out for them and and once you get into the border communities you will also get into communities where there are nationalist or unionist minorities and or majorities and substantial numbers and uh, you would pick up the nuances of of the centenary in a much more complex way it's really interesting about the border. Um, we spoke to, for the re research that I'm doing, we spoke to an orange man in Newton Cunningham last week. And it's a sort of an expression and a, a voice that you don't really often hear. And he was saying that he feels, despite everything that's happened, you know, he obviously wasn't around in 1921, but he feels as British, he said, as somebody who is um, born in Dublin, living in London. And it, it sort of struck me that, is there a sense, do you think, in those border communities on both sides that things could have been different, but there's still an element of, of bitterness there that you perhaps won't get in other parts of the Republic? Well, it had much more direct impact on people in border areas. I, with all due respect to, you know, people in people south of Dublin particularly, the impact of partition on their everyday lives was actually relatively minor unless they had some kind of complex family relationships. I mean Paul I know has relatives from Cork as far as I know but unless they had some some family relationships that that straddled the border and some families did but for for an awful lot of people in those areas Northern Ireland was very very much a foreign a place apart to use Gerald Murphy's wonderful phrase and uh, it didn't impact on their everyday lives. It didn't impact on how they did business. It didn't impact on on, on anything on, on anything about 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 their lives. Whereas, if you lived in you know County Monaghan, if you lived in Donegal, particularly, you know, Inishowen is let's face it, you know, almost entirely cut off. And uh, for for Donegal to get in, into the rest of the Republic. Uh, you know, Northern Ireland is is the direct route. So there are all these kind of people where where it does make a huge difference. And in economic terms, there was a the Dublin Belfast economic links were marginal enough, and not not that significant. Both looked east rather uh, east west was much more important. But for example, um, the border communities, you got an awful lot of interaction, Derry being the classic case in point, but Newry, Dundalk, into those areas, the railway lines, the canals ignored the border. They took historic and geographic lines and you have to include places like Sligo in that. So all kinds of connections, North Ross Common, all kinds of connections were, were were breached by that. I mean, my late father-in-law uh, worked as a young man, uh, trained in business with an uncle who had a business in, who was born in Roscommon, but his, his business was in Oma. And these kind of networks were part and parcel. Gordon Wilson, the late Gordon Wilson was a classic case, and a skill in, but, 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 but from, but, but from Leitrim. So there was an awful lot of interaction in those communities, which came back in recent decades. You can see it if you follow the dairy sector, for example, a lot of the agricultural sector, that's been restored. But that was all really destroyed in the 20s and 30s. And, uh, you know, the Irish government didn't think about those economic imp imp impacts at all. I mean, they introduced all kinds of fairly stringent tariff protections in the 1930s, particularly. And the result is there's all kinds of dreadful stories of farmers, you know, whose milk went for, I don't know, it doesn't matter where they were, it might be a Fermanagh farmer sending milk to a creamery in Cavan, or it could have been the reverse. And, you know, their whole way of life, their whole way of doing business suddenly shattered uh, almost overnight. And, and they're having to reconfigure their lives. You couldn't get from one end of County Fermanagh to the other in 1922 without going into the Irish Free State. And they had to build, I can't remember, um, there was wonderful, there was wonderful exhibition that the, the County Museum there did about 20 years ago that I saw. And the number of bridges and roads that they had to construct to enable Fermanagh to work in a more a Northern Ireland contained manner after 1922 was remarkable. So these are the kind of things that really impact on, on, on everyday lives. It gets it beyond the politicians. 
Yeah, and it's interesting. I mean, just at this point, I would like to say, you know, feel free to sort of send your questions now. You know, we can pick those up with their particular themes. And someone is that I was just going to ask you actually on the other side of the, what became the border then, Tyrone and Fermanagh, and of course, um, what was happening uh, in the Northwest as well. You know, what about those communities there? I mean, we talk about intergenerational and transgenerational trauma now, um, and we have a better understanding of what that means. But I suppose for the, the kind of lost counties, if you see it in that uh, respect of Donegal, Cavan and Monaghan from a kind of unionist perspective, we have that mirrored on the other side where people, particularly in Tyrone and Fermanagh, um, where there were majority, you know, Catholic nationalist majorities, really felt that they were on the wrong side of, mm -hmm. of this order just as much as those communities in, in Cavan and Monaghan and Donegal. Yeah, absolutely. One of the more intriguing finds I made some years back in the National Archives, and Paul would note as well, you never quite know what you'll find when you go looking at stuff. There was, there was a commission to, to, they were looking at the revival of the Irish language in the 1960s, and there was a lot of stuff that came in to, to the then Peter Sean Lamas, who was not particularly known as a lover of the Irish language. I don't, he, his knowledge of it was very, very limited. He couldn't speak it very, he couldn't speak it fluently. I don't think he ever really studied it. But the number of representations that come in, particularly from Tyrone, uh, from nationalist areas in Tyrone, about the Irish language, because that was an area where Irish they survived relatively late, much later than many areas down in, in the Midlands and the South. And their, the, their efforts to keep the language alive and they want, they're trying to build links with that and they are trying to work out programs to send their children to the Gaelic to get the language going. And they're much more emotional and passionate about it uh, than, you know, the, the people who would have been living in County Meath or uh, you know other parts other other parts of the Republic, I, I found that stuff quite fascinating because there was an effort being made there to retain a culture that was not being given space much space with, with, with within Northern Ireland and the emotion behind some of those, those submissions. Uh, it's material I found never worked on it properly. Uh, you know, and it's one of those things I should go back to someday. It's, it's just one of those intriguing uh, things you find, well, in, incidental things you find. Yeah, and I suppose that's the thing, isn't it, for, for both communities, um, you know, both the main communities here, that sort of sense of, of having something taken away, that's what makes, you know, things different and it's sort of clinging on to identity or feeling that pull of identity. I just wonder, um, you know, when we look at what's happened here over the hundred years um, north of the border, do you think those animosities, particularly over the treaty in 1921 and 22, um, still exist? Or do you think that um, the Republic in being a kind of, um, you know, having that governance over the hundred years have been able to, to kind of settle some of that and that doesn't still exist in the way that you would perhaps get in Northern Ireland? Well, I mean, we, we've seen the most classic example of the end to the civil war in the fact that we have a government at the moment where Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael are sharing power. But in truth, as far as I was concerned, uh, you know, for, for many decades now, the, the divide between them has been relatively limited. And uh, there, are, there are families that are very passionate about this, but it's... Uh, it's I don't think it has any great significance. They will, uh, you, you will get people who will put up a picture of Michael Collins in their office and then somebody else will put up Eamon de Valera. Michal Martin has, Taoiseach has decided to keep both of them there. But then you've got John Bruton, who was a teacher some de decades back, who refused to have Michael Collins in his office, who refused to be photographed with the cast of Michael Collins, the, the, the movie, because he was of the Irish parliamentary party tradition. But these things do not cause grief, argument, uh, much passion. And I, I think there will be some passions within the Republic still that will come through when we go into the Civil War commemorations. But that's going to be much more personal and local. It's going to be family X who is known to have been involved on one side in the attack on a, an ancestor of family. It's, it's, it's going to be much more local and personal. But I think my view is I think we'll get through that. I'm not 
too too worried by that. I hope I'm correct. So I I, I think there has been you know a common a identity. I mean politically from about when 1940s on the distinction in policy between Fine Gael as it became and Fianna Fáil has been very marginal. I mean I often doing my history of the check. Who, which crowd are in now, you know, when you're following through educational policy or something else, you have to, I often have to go and look at the date and see who, which of them is in office because it doesn't make that much difference. <laughs> I'm sure they would, both parties would have something to say about that. Yeah, I'm sure they would, but, but, but in real, in the bigger picture, it doesn't. Uh, Professor Dilley, thank you so much. We'll, we'll come back to you. Um, let's introduce Professor, uh, Professor Thomas Hennessy now. Um, Good to talk to you. Really delighted to have you on as well today. Um, I just wonder, I mean, sort of mirror some of the stuff that, uh, that Lord Bew was saying, but how would you characterise the journey of unionism across the hundred years? Well, I would, uh, I would characterise it really as a tension. There's a tension within unionism that you can see before the Home Rule crisis. If you go back to 1885, where Gladstone converts to Home Rule, there's a real shock amongst... Presbyterians who tended to vote liberal, the old Liberal Party, and the Anglicans, of course, tended to vote um, for the for the Conservative Party. And the same thing happened in Britain. It was the Liberal Party attracted non-conformist views, the uh, support, and the Conservative Party tended to attract Anglican views. And so there's a real contrast, and there's a shotgun marriage because this existential threat of Home Rule forces these two broadly speaking, bands of unionism together. But that liberal tradition, a small L I'd emphasize within unionism is always sort of there. And that, and that I think um, is seen throughout the, the next hundred years at various points, it, it, it comes out and it's, um, uh, the tensions exist between them. So for example, um, I think the politics of Northern Ireland was frozen to a certain extent in 1920-22, with you know, Catholics saw uh, pogroms attacking um, their community, whereas the unionists saw the, an orchestrated IRA campaign attacking them. And Michael Collins boasted to S Sir James Craig in one of the meetings that was formed part of the uh, Collins-Craig Pact in 1922, how he organised, how he directed the um, uh, IRA units in the North. So, but as Paul was saying, they didn't, you know, there's ex-servicemen, Catholic ex-servicemen were suspected after partition, despite fighting for king and country and Ireland, the home rule, but king and country as well. And they didn't, and, and that existed, that suspicion of Catholics existed uh, before um, partition anyway. So it's, it's, um, it's a long-standing view within it, whether you could accommodate nationalists stroke Catholics into Northern Ireland at some point. And when that consensus, that frozen politics began to break down in the 1960s, a lot of these tensions came into the, um, I think came into the open with, with Terence O'Neill. And Terence O'Neill is looking towards um, the idea, can you integrate Catholics? He's conscious that Catholics have a higher birth rate. And he's also conscious that ultimately he, Catholics may come to the, the fate of the union may come to depend on on Catholics and that element that reaching out to Catholics is initially didn't engage in any sort of radical reform or anything such as mission the Taoiseach can go to Catholic schools and so forth ended up really with the Unionist Party beginning to self-destruct the Unionist Party was um, an umbrella organization. It contained everybody, it was the one unionist party. So it contained all shades of opinion. Uh, traditional unionism, which is essentially the view of Brookborough and uh, the prime ministers Brookborough and Craig before, um, before him. And the tension about reformers, what limited reforms could you do, could you engage in to maybe create Northern Ireland? Because there's an argument that Catholics wouldn't become unionists, but they might become pro-union. So that was based on an economic view um, of uh, unionism, where it could go. And um, that's the tension that I think that exists right the way through to the present day. 
Yeah, look, a question from Dominic Bryan there. And, uh, you know, are we saying that unionists failed at nation building? Well, not really, because initially it was a roaring success, unless you're a nationalist and a Catholic, because Cra when Craig spoke, I think in 1929, he said, this is a Protestant parliament for Protestant people. He was directly responding to Eamon de Valera's uh, speech down in uh, in uh, the Free State Stroke era when he was talking about, we, I quote, we are a Catholic nation, unquote. So those, at that time, that's when it was frozen. That's when those politics were frozen, when it begins to thaw. And the 1960s sees a situation where many Catholics feel that they must, at some state, integrate or, well, work with the unionist government because no, it's nearly 50 years since partition. Northern Ireland begins to look like it could be a permanent fixture. It's before the Troubles, of course. And then everything's on the table. But constitutionally, it looks like it's going to be a permanent fixture. And uh, some Catholics reach out and O'Neill begins to respond. And that's the tension that happens. So yeah, nation building is probably impossible in Northern Ireland at that stage because if you've got a third of your population that is of a different ethnic group to the majority population and self-define themselves and are defined by the larger group as uh, being in religious terms differently, it's always going to be very difficult. And it takes two to tango. I mean, nationalists had to cross the, the barrier to understanding what it, um, unionist concerns and unionists had to cross the barrier of what nationalists concern but looking at it i would say that um with the good friday agreement if we take it the good friday agreement i think there was a potential there for some agreement because nationally i mean it, the border was made invisible as long as northern ireland and the uk were in the european union it meant that the border between the two jurisdictions was essentially invisible. By invisible, I mean the security apparatus disappeared. So that was, uh, despite the, sorry, go on. No, no, I was just going to say, so was it destined to, was that nation question destined to fail then? Because the, what, you know, because as some people describe it, the two tribes on the island that, that you know, that never could meet. No, I don't think it was, it was in the early stages, it was, destined, I think, it, for no compromise. Um, but later on, it, um, there was the potential. And even quite late in, in uh, post-98, I think there was an acquiescence of the border. It didn't really matter. The border was there, the border was not an issue, but Brexit has brought the border back, of course. Um, and again, I think the 1960s, the late 1960s, could, could possibly have been a potential position for um, cr um, reaching out between the two communities. But that was blown apart in many respects by, I, as I say, the, the Unionist Party and externally from the Unionist Party, um, such as people who wanted to, who saw every move by um, unionist politicians such as Chichester Clark and indeed Faulkner, um, who was a hardliner at one stage, and O'Neill as selling them out, as selling out unionism. So it was very difficult, but it, potentially it's possible, but very difficult. So if we go back to, um, to Ben, and you know, we've talked about shipyard expulsions, we've talked about his approach. Was it of its time then, or you know, could things have been done differently? Could Craig have taken a different approach, or would he just not have had the support of unionists at that time if he had tried to be as the king had asked for to forgive and forget? It would have been very difficult um, because, I mean, the nature of the Northern Ireland state was um, the the situation. The situation was that with a parliament, that parliament is going to be very responsive to its. It's, it's electors, it's constituency. And there is an argument that if Northern Ireland had been governed directly from Westminster, there wouldn't have been necessary that problem. That might, but the nature of government, it, um, the Northern Ireland Parliament was called uh, the factory of grievances in many respects. And as long as you had that Northern Ireland Parliament, as long as you had that union's majority, it's very difficult to break away 
from that linkage between the unionist electorate and local politicians and um, and so forth. So I think it was very difficult until about the 60s when um, it was it, it was frozen in the politics of the 1920s. But that generation began to pass. But what about, uh, um, you know, if we if we look back um at 1921 and how much do you think that dictates where we are today or is it more of the the state existing for 50 years and into the sort of 60s that dictates where we are today well 1921 is absolutely crucial it dictates i mean one thing about commemoration is that it's not really history and what we're remembering is validations about what our our identities are ethnic identity uh, cultural identity our national identity. I mean, if you take, for example, just one thing, the, the commemoration 20, 2016, the Battle of the Somme, many unionists see that as this blood sacrifice for the creation of Northern Ireland. It wasn't. It wasn't to the people who fought in the First World War and died in the First World War. It was about fighting the German alleged menace and fighting for king and country and so forth. But many people see they see contemporary politics in the past. They see, they read into what they 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 tend to see now. Um, so we have to be careful about what commemoration means and what we're commemorating. I mean, what we do as historians, what we do as historians is very difficult to get to, to register beyond history books and so forth. And I actually think if we had a common curriculum, um, given multi views of history and so forth, you might actually have a situation in a, in a, in a divided educational community where unions and national used to, um, Protestant and Catholic kids would actually learn something about their community and the other community uh, and so forth. Because at the minute, it's very difficult for them. They, they get a lot of their history from their peers and parents. Um, and so that is to me a major problem, but it's doable. Yeah, do you think there's a distinction, just, uh, just a final point before we move on, is there a distinction between how unionists and uh, nationalists uh, learn and, I mean, obviously there's different school sectors, so that, that's slightly separate, but I think, do you think unionists are as aware of their history as they need to be? And is there a need for more self-reflection by unionists um, about what happened? Because I'm just thinking of the sort of current atmosphere around centenary doesn't seem that great in some parts of our kind of political world so is there you know is that what's missing a, a more of a kind of sense of of unionists saying well look what happened was wrong a bit like what Lord Bew was saying at the beginning that kind of it um admitting that there were mistakes that were made and and what happened was terrible well I was a member of the flags culture and identity tr and tradition commission and one of the things when we when we interviewed many Protestants um, was that they complained that they weren't aware of their history. They only learned, they learned British history. They didn't learn about their history, their local history, their Northern Irish history, or even the relationship between the islands of Great Britain and, and Ireland and Northern Ireland. That's a sort of like bridge between the two islands and the political traditions that have uh, grown up in both islands um, and so forth. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's difficult if you want, I mean, the Catholic community strikes me as much more confident in cross community relations and and projects, whereas the unionist community or the Protestant community um, feel, I think, a lot more, uh, they feel a lot less confident. And perhaps we need to work at single identity community uh, confidence in that cultural confidence in those communities to reach out ultimately, it's a long-term project, it's not something that can be done instantly, but there was a definite, it was consistent, absolutely consistent that unions did not know what their history was. Okay, great, really interesting, fascinating to hear your thoughts. Um, let's bring in Dr. Marie Coleman, um, who I sort of almost count on as a friend. Now, we've spoken so much, uh, Marie, over the past couple of months working um, towards the podcast. So uh, you're very welcome. I just before we kind of move on to the role of women, I just wonder, just off the back of what um, of what Thomas was saying there, is there something around how you would characterise nationalism and the you know in north in Northern Ireland on the north of this island over the last hundred years? 
Um, sorry, I, I, I just missed the uh, the part of that I was coming into the Zoom. Could you just rephrase that for me? Sure. sure. I just wonder how you would characterise nationalism in the North over the last hundred years. It's a question I put to Lord Bue and Thomas about unionism. Yes, thanks. I just I missed the, the first part of it. Um, I think uh, it has transitioned. And I think it's probably, I would agree with the point Thomas Hennessy's making there at the end. And I think it is much more confident now than it would have been at the start of the period. And I would agree entirely with what he's saying about the awareness of one's history. I recall some of the uh, events which the Community Relations Council and Heritage Lottery Fund organised around 2016 to help community groups prepare for commemorative events. And speaking to leaders within the PUL community, there was a lot of talk about understanding the others, that the unionist community could get an understanding of why the rising was so important to nationalism and nationalists could get a sense of why Islam was so important in unionist culture. And I just remember an older gentleman, I think from the Orange Order, saying, well, that's all very well, but we'd have to start by knowing our own history first. And I think he was speaking a lot about, about younger uh, people in that community and of course it was at the time of the flags protest and we know that one of the more educationally uh, disadvantaged groups are young males from that community so I, I think there is a sense there that nationalism has grown in confidence while possibly unionism has withdrawn into itself. And do you see that as a, as a problem going forward? I know there are other issues now, you know, around Brexit that have sort of changed the atmosphere, you know, really to a, to a great extent. But do you think that is something that needs to be worked on, that we need to be aware of and do something about? I suppose it's a problem if people let it become a problem or if it becomes used in a triumphal manner in one way or is seen as threatening in another. So I think that's where our political leaders do have a role in not stoking that, not stoking the divisions, which are probably, I, I, I've been in the North now for, in Northern Ireland now since 2004. I, it, it's hard to remember a time when there have been so much tensions between, uh, among the different uh, communities, certainly since the, it really has been exacerbated since Brexit in 2016. So I think we need community leaders, but we really need uh, political leaders to take a more proactive role and to look at the, um, I suppose to look at some of the comments they make as well, and just to be aware of, of the impact of public uh, utterances by political leaders on all sides. Um, when we look at gender then, I know that's, uh, that's one of the things that we, that we want to talk to you about today. The role of women, I mean, we know so much more about men because men generally kind of wrote the history books at that time. So what can you tell us um, about the role of women, given that 1921 was such a significant time with what was happening in the wider suffragette movement? I think the 1920s, when you look back at the 19-teens, the 1920s is definitely uh, the promise of the suffrage campaign unfulfilled. Ireland in the 19-teens, it, 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 the extent of female political activism is quite uh, unprecedented. You have strong activism by women in the Ulster Women's Unionist Council in the campaign against the Third Home Rule Bill. 200,000 plus women signing the declaration that accompanied the covenant in 1912. You have within the Republican movement that gets going from 1916 onwards, you have very, very significant role played by the women's revolutionary organization coming them on. And I, I suppose on to, the, 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 women active in the trade union movement around the time of the lockout in 1913. And then of course, on top of all that, you have the women's suffrage campaign where does all that political activism go after the 1920s? It is such a disappointment the way in which uh, that activism is left at the door and women are really put back in their box in the 1920s. But that's not unusual. It's that reaction internationally after the First World War, which wants a return to some sort of what's that wonderful term, normality. And part of that is putting women back in the domestic sphere. And it's not just Northern Ireland, it's not just the Irish Free State, it's not one group or the other, it's across politics. The level of female involvement in politics in the first 50 years of uh, independence for the South or for the North is dreadful. 
up until the present moment, we have had something, I think there's been, since 1980, there's been something like 130 women have sat in the doll. About two thirds of those have been active since the, the 1990s. The old storm in Parliament had something like, I think, 11 women. And some of those were uh, elected for Queen's University where they didn't even have to contest the seats. So there wouldn't have, they probably wouldn't have gone anywhere near the place if they did have to seek nomination. So th that's a, a huge disappointment. I think that the role, the, the absence of women from politics from the legislatures and it affects the it then it affects the legislation which is brought forward and how it, it's its impact on women and it's interesting as well isn't it because if you look at 1921 and you know at the same time that some workers were being expelled um from the shipyard actually women then were, were kind of were already working in the mills but were kind of drawn into that even more to keep the families going where they you, you know where the man had lost his job in the shipyard so there's a kind of socioeconomic element to all of this as well that perhaps it was it was more a sense of of some people feeling sidelined because they were too busy actually working and looking after what in many cases were very large families. Yes, that's true. And you've um, pinpointed an area where there was a divergence in the experience of women after partition in the two jurisdictions on the island. Most of us here filled in our census on Sunday. And the if we look to the first census of population that was held in the two jurisdictions in 1926, you get a, a very different view of the female experience of employment. Yeah, and Mary Daly, one of our speakers today, is probably is one of the authorities on this because she's looked at that census in detail. And it, not surprisingly, most, uh, not the majority, but certainly plurality of women in the free state were involved in uh, agricultural employment, much fewer in industry manufacturing. Whereas in the in Northern Ireland, almost half of women in employment were employed in industry and manufacturing. So there's quite a, a socioeconomic difference there. And, but that, that would decline while the proportion remained high, the numbers of women in employment in the 30s declined because of, of something uh, Lord Bew mentioned, the uh, dire economic situation of the 1930s. Northern Ireland was the most deprived region of the United Kingdom in the 1930s. Unemployment for men and women was very high. We had things like the uh, relief riots in the night in 1932. And women, or women's employment, obviously suffered there. But that was new. That was something, in some ways, linked to the troubles of 1920 as well. Because while the shipyard expulsions take place against the background of the War of Independence and the the fear of that violence spreading north, there's also a bit of a, a reaction to the economic downturn after. The First World War and what Northern what Ulster, uh, Belfast had been good at heavy industry shipbuilding went out of fashion in the 1920s. So in 1920, around the, the shipyard expulsions, there's a context there of a fear of jobs being lost and competition for scarce resources as well. Uh, but certainly women would have been on the women would have suffered quite significantly because of the poor economic nature of Northern Ireland in the 1930s. It changes then after the Second World War. And it, just, you, I mean, you've touched on that, um, you know, talking about the Declaration, talking about coming a man. I, I just interested in that kind of early 1921 period where actually the, I think the Ulster Unionist Women's Council had raised more money. They, there was a sense, um, you know, of, of upper class women trying to, you know, incentivize people to become more involved. But then that just seemed to all of a sudden disappear over the space of a couple of weeks. There was this sense, yes, we're going to put ourselves forward. We're going to stand for election. And then that just, as you say, perhaps where, where women just put back into a box and thought, no, actually, it's men that will do this. I think in the immediate context of 1920 to 22 was a concern about running uh, female candidates within the Unionist Party because of the violence of the period. So I, th I think that's the deterrence. And they never really recover from that. But where do the suffragists go? Where, wh why do the women who are so active in the suffrage movement in the 19 teens, why do they not emerge in the in politics in the, the 1920s. Maybe where we can find them is things like the labour movement. And again, maybe the, the weakness of labour in the Irish free state and the way in which labour, uh, Thomas Hennessy spoke there about 
the umbrella nature of unionism. The Ulster Unionist Party worked very hard to ensure that unanimity and to accommodate, say, labour unionists to make sure they didn't emerge as a, as a threat to official unionism. But it's, it's areas like that outside the main division where we have to go and look for some of the women activists. And you find someone like, say, say Betty Sinclair, one of the, the better known female activists in 20th century Northern Ireland, who emerges in the 1930s during the outdoor relief riots to forge a significant career as a socialist, a radical socialist in Northern Ireland. So she's probably better known than probably any female politician up until the, the 1980s anyway. Yeah, because I'm thinking of somebody like Dara Parker, who, you know, uh, most people probably, if you walk down the street, uh, you know, anywhere in the north would, would, would never have heard of her, whereas, you know, she was the longest serving female politician. But it's almost like even the ones that were in, um, you know, in the history books have kind of been forgotten within the history book. Mm -hmm. And she's, yes, she's interesting again. And again, I think her, she really, her appointment as Minister for Health in the Stormont government in 1949 epitomises the paucity of women at the upper levels of politics. In the Republic of Ireland, it would take 50, uh, it would take between 1918 and 1979 before they had uh, another cabinet minister that, to bridge the gap between Constance Markovich and Maura Gagan Quinn being appointed as minister for the Gaeltacht in 1979. Dara Parker was the only female minister in the old Stormont government appointed for help in 49. And it's interesting that the job she was given was help, which is kind of seen as the women's job. But it, the help point actually, it, it, just to pick up on a point I, I had alluded to, but um, expand on as the importance of the post-war settlement. A, a, a point you raised with Lord Bew were missed opportunities by the Unionist government and to me is that post-war welfare state is the missed opportunity of the Unionist governments in Northern Ireland. You have a situation there where you have the National Health Service, you have national insurance and national assistance, you have Colonel Hall Thompson's Education Act, which is so important for the uh, welfare state benefits of Catholics, it, it, improving their, the level of education. Baselbrook's government had an opportunity to sell Northern Ireland to Catholics in the 1950s, and they didn't take it. And to me, that is probably the greatest missed opportunity to reconcile Catholics, a generation who, who were Northern Ireland born by then. That's the biggest missed opportunity to sell Northern Ireland and it, to reconcile Catholics to, uh, to the Union. As Thomas Hennessy said, you're not going to turn them into Unionists, but you could possibly reconcile them to the Union. Yeah, I mean, just to sort of counter to that and, and the sort of opposite question that I put to Thomas and to, to Lord Bew was, um, you know, were there, were there missed opportunities on the nationalist side? You know, were there chances in the 20s and 30s to engage more in this new state? Yes, and I think so. And that would be the most legitimate unionist criticism of Catholics. Possibly a very good example of that is the 1923 Lynn Committee, which was set up to look at education in Northern Ireland, which the Catholic Church boycotted and then objected to the Lord Londonry's Education Act, which emerged from it. Uh, so the, yeah, I think that that could be seen as one of to go back to the National Health Service. There was the disagreement about the Matter Hospital, which remained outside the National Health Service. Now, there's two again, as always, there's two sides to that story. The unionist government would say, oh, well, this is just an example of Catholics not wanting to play ball with us. Uh, the Catholics would say, well, that is just an example of unionists, uh, the unionist government, at least. Um, try, uh, they basically want a land grab they, uh, and they want to uh, take control of our hospital and dilute Catholic influence and Catholic control. But they, those potentially stand out uh, as two examples of where Catholics had an opportunity to work within the framework of Northern Ireland and did not do so. Okay. I mean, thanks so much. I'm just going to take some of the questions now because they're they're piling up here, um, and I don't want people to feel that we're not getting to them. Um, oh, this is so. Craig is asking, um, Lord B. I'll put this one to you. Uh, how well do you think Republicans know their Presbyterian roots? It's coming back in. Am I in? There we are. Sorry, I was uh, not. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear yeah, you. Lovely. Sorry, I was just. Uh, technical difficulty for about five seconds. Sorry, no you were going to say, Tara, the, the, the question? Yeah, so, so, yeah, we've had a question here. How well do you think Presbyterians know their Republican history? 
Well, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think Presbyterians broadly do know that they were a very significant part of the United Irishman movement. Uh, and, and I, I, you know, I, but I, I can remember my um, uh, colleague, Mary's colleague, I think as well, or platform about Tony Stewart in Queens. Now, this is, you're now talking about a historian older than myself. I believe they can be fine. And Tony told me where he died that when he started his, his MA at Queens, which is actually brilliant, it's on the transformation of Presbyterian politics between the 1790s to 1825. So it's radical Republican, and by 1825, he's liberal unionist. And he remembers being told by older Queen's professors, we don't want to know about that stuff. Why are you doing that? That's the kind of thing that we really just don't want to talk about anymore. So there is a little bit of that there. But I would say mostly in my more modern experience, Presbyterians are interested in their own traditions. And they're interested in the fact that long after Presbyterians ceased to be, um, if you like, Republican, they were liberal and they were the, by far the best educated community. They were at the centre of the business achievements of Belfast. Their literacy was above that, not just of Catholics, but of Anglicans by miles. So they sought themselves as the brains, essentially, of, 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 of Ulster Unionism. They were full of the sense of the links which were real between the Union Theological College and the great university in America like Princeton and so on. They really did think they were at the center of everything. They also felt that they were the people or their business acumen which had made Belfast one of the world's leading industrial cities. You could actually argue, and it comes from size, it's the world's leading industrial city in terms of the output in a small area. All of which, Mary is quite right, crashes in the interwar period. Uh, uh, and, and uh, you know, it really needs the welfare state, as she's also quite right, to actually, you know, re return some kind of um, stability to living standards and working class Belfast. But that, so that, you know, there is, I, I don't think it's as bad as it was when Tony Stewart started out his work 50 odd years ago. The president here is just wanting to repress the whole thing. Now there is a kind of polite interest and they're probably weary with the whole, what, what many unionists and Protestants do feel, the stereotype, the stereotyping of their own community and its traditions. So they're not quite happy to say, let's look at this and look back at, look, look, look back at, uh, at what happened in the past and why we evolved in the way they did. They're more, they're more relaxed about it now than they were. Lovely, thank you. Um, another question, this one uh, says it's for Marie, but I'm going to put it to Mary as well. But Marie, first of all, does the absence of women in both states reflect the extreme conservatism of the states that were created? Yes, I think it does. And I'm glad the uh, whoever asked that question had the plural of the two Irelands, because growing up in the South, uh, I think there's been, a, there has certainly with the declining influence of the Catholic Church in the last 30 years, there's been a bit of a, a backlash against the church and that all their influence was bad. And you would think that the only conservative, conservative force on the island was the Roman Catholic Church. And I, I, I the, uh, a lot of the Protestant churches would have held equally um, socially conservative views. It's not just the case that the, the Catholics were the ones who were against uh, contraception and, and wanted censorship. There's lots of support for that across all of the Christian denominations and in the, um, in the North as well. But also we need to get away from the sense that somehow all of this was imposed unwillingly on, on women because that denies women any agency in this. And Cara DeLay's work on women uh, in Catholicism in largely focused on the South shows how, how women were, uh, women themselves held a lot of these socially conservative views. So I think there's, I think that is a, an important factor, but it's not just that everything is being imposed on people from the top down by these institutions. People have agency in these institutions themselves. Uh, and and uh, is the, I suppose it, it's a question is society a reflection of the, is that the church influence on society or is the church, are the, these churches themselves a reflection of the views within broader society? So I think that there's a bit of a, um, a bilateral relationship there between the institutional churches and their congregations. Mary, if I can put that question to you as well, I mean, do you see the absence of women in both states?
leading to the conservatism of, of those states? Uh, you know, did women have a voice at that time? Well, first of all, I, 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 I really agree with Marie on the fact that I think we there's a lot that is common north and south. And I think we, we should sometimes reflect on that. And a lot of that would fall into social and moral conservatism. And we need to acknowledge that, that it, our, our, the views on an awful lot of issues were not dissimilar between Catholics, Protestants, between North and South. But I think there is a specific factor in the Republic that when they, there, there, there was a cohort of women who were very vocal, very active in the, in the Republican movement. Uh, when it came to comes to the 1921 Anglo Irish Treaty, and we've all parsed it up, down, in and out, there is only one consistent pattern in how people voted in Dáil Éireann, and that is that all the women voted against the treaty. And uh, that did actually lead to a real misogynistic backlash. Some of what was said about them by people, it, you know, that, that, that they were bloodthirsty militants. And uh, I mean, some, some of the language used by fellow uh, nationalist politicians is quite extraordinary uh, at the time. But the result is that they actually do put themselves outside the political tent. Now, when de Valera sets up Fianna Fáil, and it's not often recognised, and he's often seen as this ultra-conservative figure, uh, four of the committee people in the original Fianna Fáil party were women of, uh, I think, maybe about 14 or a dozen. I defy you to find any other political party in Europe in the 1920s that would have so many women, except that... When it came to making compromises, going into taking the oath of allegiance, going into the All Aaron, people like Hannah Sheehy Skeffington, you know, some of them walked away. They didn't walk away on gender issues. They walked away on, on, on the more militant Republican issues. So there was a remarkably feisty and impressive cohort of women eh, who didn't settle down to the mundane and compromises uh, that were required to live politically uh, in an independent Ireland. And I think it's very sad that that happened. They're there on the sidelines. You see them coming in, critiquing the constitution, critiquing other things, but you know, they're, they're kind of off stage. And, that, and, and that's, that's very sad because the people who come into politics in, in, the, in the free state in the twenties, they're still there in the 60s and then the children take over and because there were so few women there the women are not there and Irish families were large and there was generally a son to take uh, to take over and um, Maura Gagan Quinn who, who re mentioned as captain minister she comes in when her father died she, her father was a politician TD and she she takes over the, she she's re -elect, she's elected when her father dies so um, so I think there's a complex story, but I, there, they are both conservative states, and the, you know the belief is that women women have a have a role, but it's it's as homemakers largely. The exception to that, of course, is the Catholic Church, where there are these formidable women that run large hospitals, schools, etc., often with great ability, but their names their names are not recorded much by it anywhere. And do you, did you find that frustrating as a historian whenever, you know, whenever you first sort of started out, as it were, that women even, you know, I'm thinking of the, the two barristers, one from the north and one from the south, you know, the, the first barristers on these islands, you know, were women. Um, you know, I don't imagine that many people know about them. I don't know, are there plaques for them, you know, in the Bar Library in, in Belfast mm -hmm. or, or in Dublin? So it, does that, is, has that been a source of frustration for you or have you just accepted that that's just the way it is? Well, I, I think there is, a math, there is a certain degree of hidden history there. There are more women that should be recognised than, than we have recognised. And uh, there are women in medicine that played very important roles in terms of things like public health, um, you know, a vaccination, um, children's health pediatrics they have to be got away and then the, there there are small groups of a uh, women social workers and so forth that also need so there, there is a degree of retrieval that needs to be done when you move from the the high politics story but if you're concentrating on the captain ministers i mean you've mentioned dame dara parker who is probably uh, over that period the most 
prominent woman politician, you know, on the island. Uh, but you but you then move into Kathleen Clark, Lord Mayor of Dublin. There are more of them there than we have given credit for. Okay, lovely. I just want to take another question now. Um, let me see. Yeah, I mean, uh, Thomas, I'll put this one to you. Is there a danger of asking history to do too much in terms of reconciliation? Um, you know, does knowing our history or understanding the complexities actually change anything? Is there, you know, are we in danger of too much commemoration? Um, I, I think commemoration isn't history. It's just not history. It's a version of history. It's a myth. It's a simple story that, and I'm not criticizing, I'm just saying that it's a simple story, a simple narrative that contains a grain of truth. Um, and people tell these stories and they become what is known as history. We think if I take my, if I take I'm, I'm English born, if I take my, the, the situation, um, you know, the national story is from Agincourt to Waterloo to the Blitz and so on. That doesn't tell it, that's a version of history to get perhaps a political viewpoint. In Northern Ireland or in Ireland generally, I think um, we don't have enough history. We don't know our history. We know versions of our history. And commemoration, there can be too, too much commemoration because you're commemorating a version of history that is now and you accept it as history. It's not what the truth is. And I think the way that can, I mean, we don't operate in a vacuum. I mean, there are other countries, post-conflict countries that operate, that have addressed this problem. And for example, the UN a Special Rapporteur looked at um, uh, post-conflict countries and argued that the education system is quite central to this. Exploring um, identities exploring the history and giving multi-layered versions of history so in the northern irish context it would be a unionist history alongside the republican history alongside nationalist constitutional history or whatever you want to call it and you would give these views and you may let the kids decide that this is where the kids can understand what this what the history was because at the minute it seems to me that I think it's a first step, the commemoration, and I think it's a great step that commemorations have been conducted and they have generally respected. The commemorations of 2016, for example, are radically different to the commemorations of 1966. And that is, that's a step forward. The next step must be to actually look at the education system. If we have divide, if we have separate schools, and I know the shared, school system um, the shared uh, education system is a step forward but if we had a common curriculum of Irish history the problem at the minute is that the um, history of um, Ireland in the common history curriculum is scattered so you might do the Normans we do the Normans and the Angevins the Norman Empire and stuff you don't have a narrative that takes from the Norman invasion um, in the 12th century to, through to the Northern Irish conflict. You don't get an idea of what that is. And I think that's the key thing that you have to address. And that's where history comes in and commemoration goes out. And why do you think we've, uh, we don't sort of change the curriculum? I mean, I'm sort of thinking, you know, of children today are probably learning a very similar history curriculum to children in the 70s and 80s. And that seems, you know, from, from an outsider to be quite incredible. So why do you think, and, and lots of these conversations have been had way before, you know, way before the centenary or the decade of centenary. So why do you think we have kind of allowed, you know, especially if you look at the difference between the North and the South and in terms of what is it, you know, what is presented in history education in the South compared to what is presented in Northern Irish, uh, Northern Ireland schools? Well, I can't really comment on the education system in the South, but in the North, it's a, it's um, uh, it's it's people are afraid of the conversations. Teachers are as afraid of the conversations and stepping on controversial territory, um, and that's part of the problem. That they're afraid to address um, issues that they may get parents coming back at them. But that's not good for society. In a longer term, we're we're potentially creating the same.
um, myths in the same communal divisions and so on. If we were to take it forward, I think it has to be the education system. See, for example, the education system, here, the, the education body here in the north. Um, I think it's got a great curriculum, and in many respects, it has a great curriculum where it covers all great issues of history, and you can study this. But it needs a core element; otherwise, you're just perpetuating this social division for again and again, and they're not doing. Yeah, anything. but as far as as far sorry to cut across you, but as far as I'm aware, you know, it's not until sixth form that Irish history comes into. I think there's a little bit of Irish history in GCSE, mm -hmm. but if you've got those children who are P1 to P7, and then years eight, nine, and ten. If they don't take history on, then that you know they've they've learned about the Normans, they've learned about the Battle of Hastings, they've learned about King Henry and his wives, but yet they're not learning about the place you know they're living in and, and potentially growing up in. That's right. It's too diverse. It's too scattered. And if you're only studying history after sixteen, that's a choice, and people are missing out. Or the it's it's a question of what's good for society, and I think there's a resistance among certain professionals here to understand that this is still a post-conflict society. This is the early days of what is necessary to deal with the legacy of the violence and ethnic division and cultural division, cultural identity division. And if you want to address that, if you want to make this, you know, you, to make a society in which there is mutual understanding and respect for all traditions, that's the step you have to take. Um, Mary, I just wonder, could I put some of that to you and just get a sense of, of the education system in the South? And do you think that uh, that children in the South, I mean, we were talking to somebody recently who said that until, you know, the film Michael Collins was made in, in 1996, that actually he had been airbrushed out of history. So, you know, is the Southern state as, as, uh, as guilty, perhaps, of, of leaving out key information? Well, I don't think Michael Collins was remotely airbrushed out of history before 1996. <laughs> um, I, I, I completely, I completely agree with Marie there. I think that's, I think for, that, that's were, somebody in fantasy land. Actually, yeah, the ones who were airbrushed out of history are the women uh, we talked about. I mean, I recently took down my old school Leaving Cert history book, which is now 30 years old, and the prominent figures on the front, I think Constance Markovich was stuck in there among all the Parnells and the De Valeras and people like that. The curriculum in the South has been revised with input from people like the Women's History Association of Ireland, and it has moved more towards social history. But still, the, the, the social history is still a small enough element. I mean, there was a question on last year's, uh, I think it was last year's Leaving Cert when eventually it went ahead, there was a question about something that Parnell did. And the assumption was that this Parnell was Charles Stewart, whereas might as well easily have been Anna Parnell or uh, her sister. So um, it has improved in the South. But there's also this... Uh, I now can comment on both because I have children going through the northern system and I agree entirely with Thomas's point there. There's a chronological coherence to the south. I, prime, there's no, I don't understand the logic to the primary school curriculum in the north where the um, seven and eight year olds are doing the Second World War and learning about Anne Frank in concentration camps. And then the 10 year olds are doing the Vikings. And then the year after that, they do, they do the, the Romans. Then they go into year eight in post primary school and they do the Normans. But they do the, 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 um, the Edwards and the Henrys uh, and the, um, the Edwards and the Harolds in the Normans. And they don't seem to know, learn anything about Carrick Fergus Castle until they do geography and learn about Norman <laughs> settlements. And then they're kind of gone behind. It, it, there's no coherence to it. It seems, I don't know, it just seems a bit, it, there's a lack of joined up thinking there. Uh, and I think that is something that needs to be addressed. What they may do it in, in great detail, but they don't relate the disparate elements of the curriculum to each other. So I think SIA could do with, with a bit of, um, a bit more thought into the, uh, it, uh, it, it, they really need to be able to see the, the wood for the trees here and in, in the, the way the history is taught. But again, the big problem is a problem here with the A-level system as well because of the, the very narrow focus from 16 to 18 on three or four subjects. Now, the Leaving Cert in the South is going through its... Um, it, 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 I think uh, the pandemic's been waiting the long grass for the Leaving Cert and its emphasis, very strong emphasis on exams. 
And that's been shown up to be problematic. But apart from that, the wider emphasis on maybe seven or eight subjects is a more rounded approach than the narrowness of BA levels. Yeah. And, and, and if I could, if I could just add, the, add there, we have what we call a transition year, which is a year out of syllabus basically. And one of the things that uh, has been done during the uh, decade of centenaries is to draw up a, a certain amount of material relating to the key events, uh, which schools can take as transition year uh, projects. So it does give uh, school children who may not, who may be taking a more scientific or a more applied uh, focus in their in their in their final two years of secondary school, that opportunity to engage with with historical material. Uh, at that stage, so I, th I think they have. I think they have more more opportunities to study history because of the a, a, the focus on a seven or eight subject a, curriculum. And also, I do think transition year has been used quite quite effectively to let to let school children and lots of them have gone in and looked at local material as well. Yeah, Lord B, I just wonder um, if we can bring you on this. I'll take one final question on, on the history side of it and. Uh, it's this, does the continued absence of an official truth process about the legacy of the recent conflict impact on the teaching of history in schools? It's an interesting question. Oh, it's a really interesting question. And I've changed my mind in my thinking about that about five times already. <laughs> and, uh, and probably will change it again. It's, it, it, it's really very, very difficult. Uh, um, I, 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 I can remember uh, the, Boris Hayes, who was a great figure in the history of Northern mm. Ireland, mm. Uh, um, Dr. Boris Hayes, um, both as a civil servant and advisor to various ministers, uh, uh, and then in the Senate in, 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 in Dublin, I think I'm right, Mary. Uh, yes. I, c I can remember Boris Hayes saying that we should tell the people in Northern Ireland, as Christ said to Lazarus, lift up your bed and walk. Uh, I mean, there's just no, uh, um, you know, that going the, the, going back over these this awful human tragedy, just is is it, and the way in which inevitably we because Thomas is quite right, it is to the post conflict society, the way that we're doing it, you're just not got you're certainly not going to get reconciliation, and I actually do believe that. That you may have to go back or you may have to meet certain decisions about prosecutions, no prosecutions, whatever. But I am convinced it's perfectly obvious that all the effort to bring about reconciliation have failed. That's why I'm so tempted. And I know it's glib and I know it hurts people when they're when fair to that view of Morris Hayes. But when I heard him say it about 10 years ago or so, I did think, yeah, you know, that, that you know, it, it, it isn't true that every European country has come to terms with its own dreadful history. France never really came to terms with the behaviour of the French during the German occupation. The Spanish have what do they call it, the, the Pact of Forgetting about about Franco and the Spanish Civil War. Um, I, I just really, I, 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 I'm very hesitant to say what I've just said, but. I'll put it like this, because I'll probably change my mind by tomorrow anyway, as I've just said. But there's a part of me which responded very sympathetically to what Dr. Dr. Hayes said on that day. Uh, uh, it just that, that that's a, a key. And the other thing I, I do have to say is this, that it isn't just a matter if the union is a fact. Um, unionism is caught between the Professor Todd saw many years ago, a little Ulsterist tradition and a greater British tradition. And one of its great problems now is not its problems with nationalism, which are there, but not much different. Uh, and things are made harder by Brexit. But one of its great problems now at this moment is its greater British tradition is weaker than ever it was. Its understanding of the rest of the United Kingdom is weaker than ever it was. And I'm not, by the way, saying it would be disconcerting to them if they did understand it more. I'm just saying that they don't understand it particularly well. So, I mean, th these are... The, the, these are these are you know that, that I think is part of the problem. We, we there's a danger of discussing things within to use the unflattering term the goldfish bowl of Northern Ireland. The, it it isn't justified, but it, it has this relationship with this wider place. 
and how that plays in, how that plays into the consciousness of the Indian community, it's very disparate, much more divided consciousness. We're not anywhere near being capable of the best analysis was written many, many years ago by Professor Todd. And I think that's about 30 years old, that article. In 1987, she wrote. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to take some, we do, we do still have some time, so keep, uh, keep your questions coming if you want them. Um, let me see. Thomas, I think I'll give you this one um, and then maybe Paul, if you want to comment on it at all, but, uh, on it as well. But has Irish unionism as an all Ireland tradition been written out of the narrative because of the creation of the Northern State? Mm. Edward Carson would have been very much part of that tradition, just as nationalists mm. in the North felt abandoned by Southern nationalists in 1921-22. Southern unionists had a similar feeling of abandonment and betrayal. Yeah, they did. Um, I mean, it, it happened in 1916, before partition itself, when um, uh, there was a deal uh, negotiated by David Lloyd George and John Redmond and uh, Sir Edward Carson. It was incidentally agreed. He told he incidentally told John Redmond that partition would be temporary, and he told Carson was it was going to be permanent, which is the only way you could get a deal. But that's Lloyd George for you. Um, he. The, the, and there was a there was a conscious effort, a conscious decision by unionists to to cut the deal in the north and to make it that um, we would be the the only sanctuary for other unionists abandoned. And there was tremendous hurt in border counties that because the original covenant was about, in 1912 was about preventing the nefarious. Uh, all Ireland Parliament for all of Ireland, and that was a quite an abandonment of of that. So they were they were there was a lot of pain. There was a lot of pain for people after partition itself, and many people felt they couldn't live in the um, the new Ireland. There's a question of whether they the, many Protestants. I mean, the Protestant population in many respects collapsed over, over decades in Southern Ireland, and that's because essentially. There weren't enough Protestants to marry Protestants, and the natory um, uh, doctrine of you know the Catholic Church saying if you married uh, if you married a Protestant you had to bring up the children as a Catholic was in fact carried out. There wasn't genocide. It wasn't anything like that. It was just a natural state of affairs um, in Southern Ireland. And if you looked, if you know Unionists in the North, they looked across the border and they saw the decline of the Irish of the um, Protestant population in the South, and the Protestant population became certainly it's a question where they could be integrated but they were more or less assimilated into the um southern irish um uh political system and, and population yeah it's interesting some discussion i mentioned earlier about um people in newton cunningham and donegal um just while you're there thomas um it's just one more alan cully has said the reality is that the provision of irish history here is much more nuanced and reflective than is being presented and many of the criticism voiced have validity but you're in danger of perpetuating the myth that irish history is not taught indeed other conflict areas have come here to learn will the panel support a more informed public debate on the issue i will support a more informed public debate but i think uh, alan and i disagree <laughs> because um I, i'm afraid that yeah, Irish history, I never said Irish history wasn't thought, taught here. I said it was diluted. And there's no, and, and what SIA does, it has a, a great curriculum, but Irish history is spread throughout it. And Mary, uh, Marie indicated that as well with her kids. And I think there needs to be an exception that there needs to be a concrete uh, uh, decision to make to have one module, one element of the history curriculum, leave it diverse, but keep it, that there needs to be an Irish or whatever you want to call it, um, that using the term Irish history might be controversial here, having some element of looking at the history of this area, this region of Ireland and its relations with its sister island and the rest of the island, because it's not being addressed. It's not being addressed and we are a post-conflict society. Great, thank you. I'm going to take one uh, more question and make a final call for questions because um, we'll kind of work towards, uh, you know, there's stuff around um, how we should mark the centenary and a little bit about Brexit that I'd like to put to all of the um, all of the panelists. So if you do have any other questions, um, you know, do get those through now. Um, 
Lord, if I can come back to you on that, how much, I mean, obviously your relationship with it, with this place and um, with various different sort of sections of the community, I mean, you've talked about civil rights, you know, we know the relationship with unionists and how do you think Brexit has changed the narrative? Oh, I, I don't have any doubt that Brexit is destabilising and I've written a piece in the TLS measuring exactly how destabilizing it's been in terms of Northern Ireland. Uh, uh, um, but that having been said, it's, there is just a possibility now that that phase is ending for a variety of reasons. For one thing, there's absolutely no question there's not going to be a hard border or anything like that. They're actually, to be absolutely honest, that was agreed at the end of 2017. And it would, we're several years into that as a reality. Uh, uh, so there's absolutely no question of a hard border uh, uh, in certain respects in terms of retaining European citizenship and so on. Nationalist communities' exasperations and dislike of Brexit have been, to some degree, at least palliated. The common travel area remains, etc. Um, the Erasmus funds and so on. Uh, and the other, and the problem remains with the unionist community at the moment, uh, um, and that is essentially a question of whether or not. Just at this moment, because of the unilateral action by the British government, the, the appearance of the problems arising from what is called the REC border, which actually isn't, to be pedantically not in the protocol at all. There's no such thing in the, in the protocol. And Mio, what, uh, what's his name? Barnier says it's not a REC border. But the problems related to these checks, whatever you, and these were coming, they were agreed in 2017, at least as far as agri food. Uh, um, the, this has all been in set in. In, you know, in, in documents agreed between the EU and the UK before Christmas 2017. So we're now dealing with, uh, this is, we're now possibly coming out the other side of this. Uh, um, it's far too early to say because of the instability within unionism and the divisions registered in the, in the opinion. Nonetheless, um, it's an interesting moment because they, there's no question that Brexit was fundamentally destabilising, but certain issues have, are now over, re resolved entirely. What really matters is this, that the Good Friday Agreement is, as the withdrawal agreement says, respected in all its parts. And there are two key things in the Good Friday Agreement. The expansion of North-South depends on the cooperation of the Northern Ireland Assembly. Union's community, not in its present mood, is not going to. Uh, give that cooperation. So one of the objectives of the protocol is is the expansion of North South, but it, it requires consent. And East West, and we have all forgotten. Uh, one of the things that nationalists insisted was that there was a fourth strand to the Good Friday Agreement, not actually written, not there, and you can read it a long time. But nonetheless, that was the strand of Europe, and it had to be taken into account. And the actual third strand, which is written, has been forgotten about. And the third strand is about East-West, it's about the relationships between the two islands, but particularly, most importantly, or not most importantly, but importantly, the Northern Irish Assembly and London government. And that, it commits itself to the promotion of a totality of relations, good East-West relations. The level of interference we have at trade last month did not fit with the third strand of the Good Friday Agreement, to be blunt. But as everybody agrees that that's what they're trying to do, uh, that they're working within the framework of that agreement, it should be doable. Uh, and we should reach compromises. If we do reach the sort of compromise that work out, then it is possible that we are moving, and some of the polling already seems to show this, that we're moving out of that very intense destabilization, in part, by the way, caused by the fact it was the Catholic middle class more was more annoyed by Brexit than necessarily the Catholic working class. The Catholic middle class, the one that, which is, uh, you know, allegedly the most settled down in Northern Ireland and, uh, and, and um, gaining most materially, was undisputably found quite as a real insult to them. It's a major, that, that's one of the transformative negative features of Brexit. There's no doubt about it. But there is some evidence in the current polling, Queen's polling, others, that we are moving out, that people are deciding to make the best of a bad job, and the circumstances of COVID, vaccines, and so on, are all tend to intensify the, the feeling of, of, of making the best of a bad job. We're not there yet. It could yet spin out of control wildly. Everybody could see what could happen politically. Uh, um, 
and it and, and there is the possibility the worst case scenario is you get within the indus community a decisive growth in opposition to the good friday agreement on the ground that the protocol and the good friday agreement and something called an all ireland economy which doesn't exist it's not in the good friday agreement it's not in the protocol is 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 going to uh, bring about political unification by stealth. So that's the worst case scenario. And that could still happen within unionism, that people say, uh, you know, it's all the fault of the, the original sin of the Good Friday Agreement. And therefore, and if, you, if enough unionism goes in that direction, then I'm afraid we, everything I've just said about maybe some aspects of the crisis are coming down will be totally wrong. And it will really be a mess. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Mary, I wonder from a Southern perspective uh, how Brexit is being viewed, you know, when it comes to the relationship between the two parts of this island. Well, I, I think some of the worst fears when in 2016 have, have really disappeared. I think the, the practical relationship is not being disrupted the way that people feared, people feared it might have been. Um, the, a lot of those common economic interests are working pretty well. I think the Dublin government has made very serious efforts. The Irish government has made very serious efforts to look after the Northern Ireland interests uh, throughout a lot of the negotiations. You could have argued on a narrow economic terms, there's much more trade east-west than there is north-south. But the whole focus of the Irish government going through the whole Brexit negotiation was really on, 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 on looking at Northern Ireland and trying to keep a, a, the relationship moving a, smoothly between the two parts of Ireland in, in, in a variety of areas. And what's quite intriguing, there's recent trade figures which have shown a huge fall in imports from Britain but they have shown increased business between Northern Ireland and the Republic. So um, I think there, there will be some intriguing developments in that respect. But I, I, I think you'll find particularly in, in, in foreign affairs that it, there's a very close eye on, on any destabilizing uh, of the Northern Ireland relationship. I mean, when when uh, when Ursula von der Leyen came out a, a, a very thoughtlessly and, and invoked uh, in, in, invoked that article, I think it's sixteen. Um, a, I mean, Michael Martin moved almost instantly to make sure that that was addressed, and the the Irish position on this was, was very very clear cut uh, on the time. So I th I think. We're dealing with Brexit now um, because of the abnormalities of, of COVID. It's, it's, we still can't quite see the implications, but I think the implications are going to be much more east-west uh, for, for the Republic than north-south. And it will build slightly different trading relationships that are, that are, that are, work, that are working their way through. A uh, long term, I suspect what we're into is the historic decline of the economic dependency on Britain uh, within the Republic. I mean, you, you, you can track it from the 70s onwards, uh, and uh, that, that's just, just that's just going to continue. Uh, you're also going to see kind of different trading patterns. Ross Lair directed to Europe beginning to emerge. Northern Ireland. I mean, I've seen some of the North. Bernard and uh, seafood producers who are facing great difficulties because I think my understanding is Dover is a nightmare. I mean, they're now rooting through Rosslair and the direct uh, boats to Dunkirk or wherever they go. So th there's going to be those kind of changing relationships. But I think common sense will prevail. And uh, a, lo a lot of the apocalyptic stuff that emerged in some 2016 has receded, which is very, very beneficial to very beneficial to everybody, and I and I'm very pleased the Irish government has ensured the Erasmus system will continue for 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 Northern Ireland students. Yeah, um, Marie, do you uh, do you agree with what uh, what what Mary said there that some of the worst fears of 2016 have subsided now? Yes, I do from the Republic perspective, and I was glad there that Paul and Mary both brought in the East-West relationship because the one thing we haven't 
uh, really emphasised enough in this discussion is the elephant of the room of the role of the United Kingdom in all of this, both now and in 1921. We focused uh, very much um, Ireland focused the impact of partition on the island, which is fair enough. But there, there's a when we talk about a lack of awareness of history, uh, the the British sense of what happened in Ireland in 1921 is what is abysmal. The, the United, this was not just the partition of Ireland or as Mary pointed out, the partition of Ulster, but it was also the partition of the United Kingdom and it was the United Kingdom losing one quarter of its land mass. And there is no recognition of that in the UK as I understand it. At a time now when the union is probably in danger of splintering again from the first time in a hundred years. And it seems to me looking at the news this week, that, and over the various news reports over the past few um, few weeks, that there seems to be an inverse relationship between the size of the Union flag used by the British government and the stability of the Union. So the more danger to the Union, the bigger the flag behind Boris Johnson seems to get. And we've seen it. I mean, the Scotland, there's the danger of Scotland. And that, I remember from 2014, the... Um, genuine fear among Ulster Unionists that Scotland would leave. And I think that's there again. But even in Wales, which was the um, the comfortable part of the union, the, the current Welsh First Minister is talking about the union not being fit, fit for purpose. There's it, Some polls from Wales have indicated an increase in support for independence there. So there's a, it's, a, it's not just the relationship of Ulster Unionists to the union and the threat as they would see it of United Ireland, there is a much wider issue of the future of the Union and um, flying bigger flags on more buildings for more days will not detract from that. Um, Thomas, I'll bring you in there, um, you know, fr from your position over there. Um, do you agree with what Marie has said? Um, I do. I think, I personally think that Brexit and the Northern, uh, Brexit is the a massive goal for unionism. Um, I think that it's it, incrementally it will, um, and Mary was mentioning it, that the, um, uh, the switch slowly towards an all Ireland economy um, and trade being disrupted between East and West. And um, I think that in many respects that the border was was a dead issue in many respects. It was it was an aspiration, but it was a dead issue for uh, nationalists. Um, and in many respects, I think that unionism with the Good Friday Agreement. I mean, constitutionally, the unionists got what they wanted. I mean, I disagree fundamentally with people who who argue that uh, the Good Friday Agreement. Um, was a defeat for unionism. I mean, they got control over their own destiny by being involved in the government for so, for the first time since 1974. They got rid of the threat of North-South um, bodies that had executive power. The Council of Ireland and Ireland Sunningdale had executive power and could become incrementally, could take decisions on its own, incrementally an uh, embryonic all-Ireland government. Um, and Trimble's red line in the whole negotiations was he had to have a north-south body a ministerial council that was essentially powerless that it was a talking shop that the decisions would be made in the Oireachtas and it would be made in Northern Ireland Assembly um, and not at an all-Ireland level and I think unionists really if I use the phrase they I think they won the war in inverted commas war used and I think Brexit is in danger of losing the peace Okay. Thomas, thank you. Um, look, I'm just going to take some final comments from all of you, if, if we can. And that's, you know, just to bring us to a neat ending. How do you think we should mark this centenary? Are you, you know, do you agree with how we are marking it in the way that we are um, in the bits that we've done so far? I mean, Thomas, because you're on, I might as well start. We'll, we'll, we'll move backwards uh, through the panel. Uh, what do you make of, of uh, you know, how we're looking at 1921 and how do you think we should look at it? Well, I think we should look at 1921 as um, essentially history. It doesn't necessarily mean that what we are governed by what happened in 1921 by what we should remember today. And that there is 
it was a particular time. It was a particular fissure in in the island of Ireland. It partitioned Ireland. It led to divisions in Ireland, but those divisions were there. But I think we should look at it and we should understand that we've come a long way since 1921. And I think it's possible, I think there's greater understanding today of the different viewpoints of the main two main traditions on the island of Ireland, which is unionism and nationalism and mutual respect. And I think it's a first step in remembering 1921 to understand that um, we should be able to recognize that the past is the past and it's not governing our future. Okay, Thomas, thank you. Um, Marie, we'll come to you next. I say it should be looked at, it should be noted in the round that uh, I know there's a lot of nationalist reluctance to engage with any of the commemorative activities. And I speak here uh, as a member of uh, Lord Bew's committee as well. So just to put that out there. But my concern would be that in, in boycotting the whole event, that nationalists lose, the nationalist community broadly, runs the risk of ceding the opportunity to explore and to explain the, ex the traumatic, in many ways, experience of nationalists of what happened 100 years ago. And that can be done without having to, um, without having to concede that this is a recognition of Northern Ireland or to, to be expected to celebrate the, the establishment of Northern Ireland. Partition and the establishment of Northern Ireland was a fact, and the the whole warts and all version of that uh, should be should be looked at. So I think we just need to uh, reflect on it as an event, but to try and have multiple perspectives on it. But also just to move beyond the, the orange and the green and to look as, as we did here today at some of the maybe the gender aspects and the class aspects as well, because class is something that uh, affected both communities, if you look at something like the, the outdoor relief riots in the 1930s. So maybe there are other lenses through which we can explore it, which are more common to both of the main communities. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Professor Daly, we'll come to you next. What about this centenary year? How do you think we should, and obviously you're on the Taoiseach's committee as well, so you can give us that perspective. Well, I mean, I think it, it would be helpful if people in the Republic maybe learned a little bit more about the history of uh, the early years of Northern Ireland because it's, I mean, it's something that is taught, but I think people could, could benefit from a greater exposure. Uh, as I said, we're, our feeling is that a lot of this, uh, uh, we would like to see local communities, uh, you know, from Mana, Monaghan, Cavan, Cavan from Mana, Donegal, Derry, those, those kind of communities beginning to explore a, what impact this had on, on their destiny. And, and it, it, it gives an opportunity for, it might be a controversial history, but it's a shared history. And when you bring it down to that level, I think people understand boundaries better in terms of where to go and where not to go, and a, that's where we want to push it. The other thing we found very valuable, certainly around 2016, uh, and Marie Coleman would have been very uh, active in this, was getting the archival record out for people to explore, um, and uh, people in the Republic, and in fact anywhere, anywhere in the world, can go on to the various uh, websites and get into very detailed documentation, maybe about their relations or about people from a community that they're interested in, or just for anywhere. And I think if, if some of the documentation, the archival material of the early years of Northern Ireland could be made accessible as well, so that people beyond Northern Ireland could begin to look at it and get a, a, a better understanding of quite what went on there. And you mentioned the archives there and the opening of that. And are you finding that in the South, are, are families looking into their family history this year in a way that perhaps they haven't done? Oh, they've been doing it for some time now and they've done it at multiple levels. I mean, uh, there was a stage there a few years ago, I, I could the number of people I kept at meeting who were off to Flanders because they had discovered some distant relative who'd fought in the Great War, and that was that was a remarkable event for many for many Irish 
families and many families that had maybe lost track of that particular tradition. But uh, what you've got is both the local, it means that school groups, the local, local historical societies, local communities can go in through these and put in the name of a locality and check about episodes, individuals and incidents that happened 100 years ago, going through the, the records in, in, the, mil in the military uh, archives here, where the participants, these are the witness statements, but I mean, you know, as, as I argued, there was a merit for it, they were all locked up until everybody involved was, was dead and therefore uh, letting them, making them available was, I suppose, less painful. But it means that people can explore those. And I think if people go into those, those micro stories, um, they always get much more complex and more nuanced. And so, and yes, they may find some very grim aspect and I'm not, I'm not denying that. But on the other hand, it, 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 it does muddy the, the simple story and give people an understanding that, that history is quite messy and quite complicated and all the richer for that. Oh, Professor Daly, thank you very much. Um, Lord Bue, if I just come to you finally, um, do you agree with uh, Marie that nationalists are in danger of losing an opportunity here by not becoming more involved in the centenary and commemorations? Um, well, I, I absolutely agree with Marie in the sense that there is going to be, in terms of the work of our committee, an absolute determination to acknowledge the bad side of events with regard to partition for the nationalist community. Um, that nobody is going to be asked to accept some version of history which just doesn't make sense in terms of their own experience. Um, and I completely agree also that there is a basic point here. It, you know, if you say that you strongly support the Good Friday Agreement, then I'm afraid one of those key principles is the principle of the and it would be a mistake. And I think, to, actually, to be honest, most of Northern nationalism gets this. Uh, um, it would be a mistake to send out the signal, well, we support the Good Friday Agreement, the bits that we like, but the principle of consent that we, we don't care about, because basically the existence of Northern Ireland does embody the principle of consent. It's as simple as that. So if you say we're not willing to discuss this event at all, it does raise questions about the sincerity of the commitment to the Good Friday Agreement. I don't actually think the majority of nationalists are in that place. A lot of nationalists, the great majority are in the place of saying, look at the shipyard expulsions, look at what happened there, and look at the other forms of sectarian discrimination the unionist regime operated. And they're absolutely in the place that that should be acknowledged. But then, as far as we're concerned, we're totally happy to do that and want to do that. And then I would also say something else to pick up on what Mary said. Uh, we are committed to a greater release, archival release of documents. And frankly, we will have, a, as a committee have failed, and I don't think Mary's going to disagree with me, if we don't achieve something in this respect so that people in Northern Ireland can see things and not all the things that they're going to see are terribly pleasant and comforting mm -hmm. for ordinary unionists. Some of the things actually not so comforting for nationalists perhaps as well, but I mean, at any rate, it doesn't matter whether it's uncomfortable or not. We are committed to a greater release of archives and we will have failed if we don't achieve something significant there. I fully accept that's a standard by which we should be judged by. Lovely. Yes, we certainly look forward to, to getting uh, some uh, access to, to those archives. Look, I, we're going to close there. I just want to thank the panellists uh, very much. That was a fascinating couple of hours. I can't believe, you know, it's two o'clock already. Um, I'd like to just, uh, you know, give my personal thanks to David Robinson from the City Council for organising this event. I think it's incredibly worthwhile um, and it's been very enjoyable and really insightful. And uh, to everyone, great thanks to everyone at ND Events as well for making it run so smoothly. Thank you very much. And a final plug from me, I promise, uh, year 21 available on BBC Signs and that's the week by week um, story of, of 1921 and uh, you know dip in there with uh, we're sort of 12 episodes in so there's, there's plenty of, of archive available but thanks to everyone and enjoy the rest of your day wherever you are thank you